Welcome to Indus Special. I am Ajaz Haider. Let's begin with COVID-19 toll. Over 2.5 million people across the world have, have been infected. 185,062 have died while 727947, that's 727,947, have recovered. The total number refers to both the closed and active cases, while recoveries and the mortality rate refers to closed cases. There are likely to be more deaths in the active cases, but while this is bad enough and likely to grow worse, let's go back to 1918 and the Spanish flu, a terrible misnomer because the flu didn't originate in Spain. 500 million people were impacted and estimates put the death toll from a low of 20 million to a high of 100 million with an intermediate figure of 50 million. Let's take this to Professor Rifat Atum, Professor of Global Health at Harvard University. Welcome, Professor. We're doing a lot of maths to figure out how to go about it. You know, the hammer, the lockdowns, uh, and then, of course, the partial, uh, you know, uh, return to normalcy, uh, which some call the dance. Uh, but take us back into history and give us a view of the 1918 pandemic. Are there any lessons there? Absolutely, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to join your program. Um, there are very important lessons, and in fact, many of the measures we're introducing today in, in relation to COVID-19 go back, go back centuries. In fact, many of these interventions are medieval in their origin. For example, um, isolation of infected individuals, quarantining uh, those who have come into with infected cases, social distancing measures, um, covering the face to, to reduce the uh, uh, reduce droplets from being being uh, from one person to another person. So many of the measures are actually uh, from the lessons we've learned a hundred years ago and even before. Now, what has changed compared to the uh, Spanish flu 100 years ago is the world is a very different place. We, we are very interconnected now and highly interdependent, with many people traveling very fr frequently, both within and across countries. So as human beings, we are the vectors for the virus uh, to enable this transmission. And that mobility and that mixing creates a huge risk for the transmission of the virus, as we are seeing in the rapid rise in the number of SARS coronavirus 2 and the number of deaths from COVID-19. Absolutely. Now, talking about uh, sort of interdependency, travel, uh, a globalized world, 1918, it wasn't the case. Uh, the world wasn't that connected. However, it seems that because there was a war going on and there, were, there was a lot of troop movement, inbound, outbound, uh, which experts say was uh, one of the major reasons for uh, the spread of that flu. But uh, there's another thing also, as I earlier said in my question to you, that we're doing a lot of maths uh, in terms of, you know, flattening the curves, in terms of exponentials and the rest of it. But give me a sense of how the 1918 flu's deadly march stopped. Was it because... Uh, we were using the hammer and the dance, uh, say, you know, singly and in tandem? Or was it simply because the virus killed X numbers and Y numbers developed immunity, and that was when the pandemic petered out? Yes, so influenza virus is different to coronavirus, although they come, they come from the same family. Typically, flu has a seasonal pattern. So that in, in, in uh, countries um, in winter months, the number of flu cases increase, and in the summer months and in hot weather, they decrease. And again, a, a virus, uh, an efficient virus is one that uh, infects enough people and does not kill too many people to ensure its transmission. So in the case of flu, um, because it has been around for many, many years, Many of us have, have some kind of memory to, to earlier 
flu infections. So we, we were able to mount some kind of response to, to, the, uh, to the flu, um, to the flu uh, uh, influenza virus infection. Um, and as, as uh, more and more individuals become infected uh, um, and they develop immunity, the virus cannot be transmitted because we are the vectors. Viruses are not live entities. They Very require human Very beings to transmit them. So if an infected person comes in contact with, uh, with a person that is immune, there is no way of transmitting that virus. And this is why the infection levels go down. So we talk about this basic reproduction number, the yeah. uh, ability of one individual to infect others. That, that comes down as immunity is developed in the community, what we call herd immunity. So, so, uh, so are we uh, looking at the same pattern? Are we, uh, you know, in terms of projecting uh, when this particular wave would end its virulence, are we looking at the same pattern of unfortunately X numbers dying and Y numbers getting immunity? This is an excellent question. And this is, uh, we're all searching for the answers to this excellent question. SARS coronavirus is new, so we don't know enough about the virus and, and the transmission dynamics, as well as how the virus behaves and how we, as the host to the virus, reacts. Uh, so, we, so we don't know how long, the, for an infected person, um, how long the immunity lasts at the moment. We also don't know the extent of immunity. We also don't know if a person who has had an antibody test to uh, unknowns. Absolutely. Thank you. That was Professor Rifat Atun speaking with us about COVID-19 and giving us a perspective of how, if we were to juxtapose this with what happened in 1918, what kind of picture emerges. We now move on to India, the world's most populous democracy, which is in illegal occupation of Kashmir and treats the population as a, as a colonist would. Three Kashmiri journalists have been booked under Unlawful Activities Prevention Act for performing their professional duties. One of them is Masrat Zara, a 26-year-old photojournalist. The others are a reporter from the Hindu, Ashik Pirzada, and Gaur Gilani, a journalist and writer. What is going on? Is presenting facts a crime now? To discuss this, we are joined by Helen Sellert, who's an analyst, activist for the rights of the Palestinians and Kashmiris, and Zafar Qureshi, who is chairman of Kashmir Campaign Global. Ms. Sellert, let me begin with you. It is very clear now that you cannot do journalism in Indian occupied and in ex Kashmir. Is that too uh, harsh a judgment or would you agree with that? Yes, I agree completely. Uh, the only thing, the thing is it, that it has been clear for very, very long. This is not the first time India is uh, um, targeting journalists in, in uh, occupied Kashmir. So the last three cases here, they have been um, uh, booked so far. They haven't been detained, but we, we also have already two journalists in, in, in jail, actually. Yes. Uh, Kasi Shibli and Asif Sultan, and they have been uh, one uh, versus two years in, 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 in jail already. And many journalists have been, been uh, targeted, uh, harassed, trashed, um very frequently so it is a, a really severe situation for for journalists in Kashmir okay so the entire world is obviously focused on this coronavirus threat and that is the big story now and as news goes it's the big story that eats up every other story and so the plight of Kashmir the plight of Palestine they've all gone on the back burner you're absolutely right. This is not the first time, but now it's become even more draconian. Now, give me a sense of, uh, for instance, you uh, are speaking to me from Sweden. Like, do you think the Swedish government and the Swedish rights groups are cognizant of what's happening in Kashmir? And if they are, 
Is there something that you think they can do? Let me start with the first uh, part here. I don't think that um, the world is aware of, of the severity because um, India is still trying very hard to paint itself as a vibrant democracy. Um, but it is like uh, it's in the top list of countries with the highest numbers of assassinated journalists the last decade. Uh, only in Kashmir, it's 19 journalists that have been assassinated since 1990. Uh, they are also uh, actually they lead the list of internet shutdowns uh, with more blackouts of communication than the rest of the world combined. Uh, and that is if we don't take into account the eight months of complete darkness, you know, the lockdown in Kashmir. Uh, so the, 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 the severity of it, I don't think the world, because, I mean, uh, three journalists in 48 hours booked for, for terrorist actions uh, in Kashmir. That would have been a massive outcry in any other part of the world uh, if it happened in any other part of the world. So okay. uh, I don't think Sela, so. Yeah. Ms. Seller, Seller, stay with me. Let me go over to Mr. Qureshi in London. Mr. Qureshi, you've been involved with the struggle for a very long time. There have been ups and downs. And um, before this corona threat struck the world, there was a certain kind of groundswell in favor of the Kashmiri struggle and, and people in the world had started taking note of what Delhi was doing. Uh, but now Delhi's got the space once again. And as Ms. Sellert said, there are not many people in Europe who are actually aware of how Delhi deals with the colony that it has occupied. Uh, so give me a sense of, you know, within 48 hours, three journalists for doing nothing except performing their professional duties. So tell me, in these corona times, how can we sell this story to the world? As you rightly said, and as Helen said as well, you know, the current situation is Kashmir is really dire. The imprisonment, the booking of these three journalists under the UPAP Act um, is, you know, unheard of and broke. The, the unfortunate thing is, that you're right, there was a time before the coronavirus where the issue of Kashmir was getting highlighted, but now the whole space, the limelight has been taken by the coronavirus. I think it's up to the media now that we must actually pay a lot more attention to the Kashmir and ensure that it is highlighted on every platform. This is the time when the journalism fraternity needs to come together and stand with the journalists in Kashmir who are being harassed, tortured, and gagged by the fascist Modi government, right? Absolutely. India is using every opportunity at this point to change the demography of Kashmir under this, um, you know, coronavirus, uh, behind the coronavirus phase that's happening. Within Kashmir, people are being still tortured, people are still being imprisoned, journalists are being imprisoned. Even the NGOs have now been stopped from uh, doing any uh, charitable work or helping people through the times when people of Kashmir were already imprisoned for eight months and do not have any livelihood. Absolutely. Well, I mean, this is, this is really God sent, frankly. I mean, this, this terrible virus, this pathogen um, that, that scared the world and, you know, literally shaved off billions of dollars from the global economy is a God sent for the government in Delhi. But here's my point. How do we, and you're right, I mean, you talk about media, but once again, uh, the dynamics of the media are such that they'll always go for the biggest story. And which is why I said that, unfortunately, this story has gone on the back burner. But, for instance, you work from London. Uh, Ms. Sailor has done a lot of work for Palestine and Kashmir. So there's got to be some kind of forced multiplication of efforts here uh, in terms of reaching out to the governments and telling them that just because there is the coronavirus does not mean that things are not happening in occupied Kashmir, or for that matter, in Palestine? 
Absolutely. I think the international community needs must come together at this point and ensure that the situation in Kashmir is highlighted at every platform, not just in the media, but within the government. It is a responsibility for the international community, the United Nations, to ensure... While everything is, yes, we're all at the moment in, um, trying to fight the coronavirus, but we must understand that there is a danger of Kashmir becoming a hotspot for the coronavirus if it's not looked at. Uh, there's a danger that there will be a massive um, demographical change and genocide taking place covertly behind this coronavirus. The United Nations has to enforce its regulations at this point and ensure that it can send a monitoring committee within Kashmir to make sure that the situation it does not go worse and it is within the control. Okay. We need oh. to pressure the government. The Pakistan needs to send out its envoys to every government. Pa Pakistan, Pakistan has been doing everything it, it can in its power, still doing that. But I think it, there's got to be a uh, you know, multiplicity of effort. Yeah. But let me go back to Ms. Saylor. Uh, Ms. Saylor, uh, one of the things uh, that I saw and that's kind of, uh, well, not exactly strange, but it's disheartening that barring some voices, some honorable exceptions in the mainstream Indian media, uh, much of the mainstream Indian media does not seem to be reporting the Kashmir story in the way that it should have. Indian media is... Uh basically an extension of the Indian government and uh, we are not getting any any um, any news about Kashmir that that that, that are true to, basically because um, and, and this is also what makes it so dangerous if journalists are silent because then we will not know what is going on in the ground and uh, they are not silenced only on the ground. They are also sil silenced online, where uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are are uh, colluding with India and, and actually restrict and suspend a lot of accounts Absolutely. speaking about the atrocities. Absolutely, because they're looking for the big market. But thank you so much. That was Helen Sellert and Zafar Qureshi speaking with us. We shall take a short break and return to discuss Iran's satellite launch and growing tensions between Tehran and Washington. Stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special. We now move to Iran and we have two items on the menu. The first is the Wednesday satellite launch into low Earth orbit by Iran's Revolutionary Guard. Some Western voices said the launch was for part of a secret military space program meant to advance Iran's ballistic missile development. Wednesday also marked the 41st anniversary of the founding of the Guard by Iran's late leader Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. International criticism of the launch has followed quickly. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Iran needs to be held accountable for what it has done. German Foreign Ministry spokesman warned that the Iranian rocket program has a destabilizing effect on the region and is also unacceptable in view of our European security interests. Criticism is also focused on the UN-mandated nuclear deal with Iran. The problem is Iran did not breach that deal. The U.S. walked out of it and the EU partners have not been able to hold their side of the deal. Either. The other problem is about the accusation that Iran is developing an ICBM program. Michael Elman, director of the Non-Proliferation and Nuclear Policy Program at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, a think tank in London, says what Pompeo is implying in his objections to Iranian satellite launch is much different than the reality. They're grossly exaggerating what Iran is learning from those particular launches. Experts at CIPRI also agree. Meanwhile, Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, and his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, have agreed to cooperate over the fight against COVID-19. Russian state media said the two leaders spoke on the phone to discuss bilateral ties and exchange of experiences to control the virus. 
In a tweet, Rouhani said, both leaders agreed that the EU must take action against U.S. behavior, which violates global conventions. The president also said the EU must act on Washington's veto of Iran's loan request from the IMF to fight the pandemic. For its part, a U.S. State Department report alleges that China, Iran, and Russia are using the coronavirus crisis to launch a propaganda and disinformation onslaught against the United States. To discuss both issues, let's get to our panel of experts. And we are joined today by Sayyid Mohammed Marwandi, who is an academic and political analyst, joins us from Tehran. We also have Mark Sleboda, an analyst in international affairs and security expert, joins me from Moscow. Let me begin with Mr. Marandi here. Starting with the satellite launch. Now, the satellite program uh, basically is an open program which began under an Iranian parliament act. Am I correct, Mr. Marandi? Yes, all, all of uh, Iranian government and state expenditure has to go through parliament. Uh, so that we have nothing that uh, is spent outside the uh, approval of parliament, although parts of the budget are not openly declared, obviously, for security reasons. But uh, uh, ultimately, they have to give approval approval for expenditures. Also, Unless there are very also, also, circumstances. also, this is not the time that Iran has tried to place a satellite in low Earth orbit. There have been other attempts. Some, uh, you know, succeeded in terms of, you know, in terms of checking the rocket motors. Some failed. Uh, why is this now such a big problem? This particular Wednesday launch. Well, you are correct that this is not the first satellite that Iran has put into orbit. Uh, this particular satellite uh, is particularly upsetting for the United States because. The Iranians have declared uh, it to be a military satellite and uh, for defensive purposes, and also in order for Iran, I assume, to be able to uh, better view what its potential adversaries are doing on the ground. And that creates sensitivity. sensitivity. And I think also the U.S. government uh, gloated a great deal because the last two attempts to Set, send satellites into orbit failed. Got it. And uh, the success of this one, I think, made it a bit uh, more upsetting than usual. Okay. Um, I'll come back to that, but let me over to Mr. Sloboda. Mr. Sloboda, the United States says Iran is a threat. Now, it seems to me that if I were sitting in Iran and looking outwards towards the U.S., and the U.S. military might, I would tend to think that the U.S. is a threat to Iran, in which case I would want to defend myself whatever, you know, uh, in terms of whatever means that I could gather. So give me a sense of, um, you know, given the, the structural impediments uh, in the international system, of how can a, a smaller country actually uh, sort of convince a larger power that it also looks at that larger power as a threat and, and that, that there is, there is a bi-directional causality here and it's not just a single cause to effect uh, problem. Yeah, um, I mean, one merely has to look at the area surrounding Iran to see the threat from the United States that is presented to them. On their western border is Iraq. The Iraqi government, uh, was, the Iraqi uh, country was invaded and their government was overthrown by the United States. Uh, Syria, close by and an ally uh, of Iran. Uh, the U.S. and its allies have conducted a proxy regime change war. And when that failed, they overtly invaded and continue to militarily occupy uh, illegally, East Syria, sitting on top of Syria's oil fields. The United States has invaded and has militarily occupied Afghanistan for two decades now. That is, uh, of course, an obvious 
threat, military threat to Iran. Further, the United States has made it, uh, you know, repeated um, uh, uh, political rhetoric statements from its uh, all the way up to its top leaders demanding regime change in Iran. Um, so, I mean, and quite clearly, the U.S. is a hyper aggressive hyper power, uh, and it quite clearly presents a threat to Iran. Iran has never presented any military threat to the United States or its people. This is well, the United a matter States. Of well, the United uh, the U.S. argument is that. Iran's actions and Iran's projection of power in the greater Middle East is a threat to U.S. allies. Uh, but, but give me a sense of how you look at uh, Iran's uh, sort of desire to acquire a certain capability in space. Um, and, and of course, the fact that you know, at some point it also feeds into, uh, in terms of technology also, in terms of knowledge, in terms of various other things, uh, feeds into the parameters that you require for longer range missiles. Of course, Iran, for a whole host of commercial, economic, and military reasons, wishes, uh, you know, like all countries, to put satellites into space, its own satellites, which it controls, uh, which it has access to. Um, uh, the fact that the U.S. is now declaring that Iran somehow doesn't have the right to do this, it's unclear by what principle, simply by its own declaration, uh, the U.S. seems to believe it has the right to uh, decide which countries can put satellites into orbit and which can't. It, it doesn't actually have any such right, it's certainly not under international law by uh, you know, again, as as a he world hegemon, of course, it is de facto acting in that regard. And this is very similar to Iran's civilian nuclear power program, uh, which uh, Russia has has long been assisting with the Bushehr nuclear power plant. The U.S. has, uh, particularly under Trump, has made it clear that it it, it views any Iranian advances in its civilian nuclear power program to also be illegal in its own curious conception. Of, of what is allowed and what isn't allowed in the world. Uh, so uh, I Iran will keep doing what it needs to keep doing as a sovereign power to develop its country. Um, and the U.S. will keep using this, this uh, political rhetoric, trying to criminalize every normal action of a sovereign power as somehow something that Iran doesn't have the right to do. Absolutely. I mean, you talked about the international law dimension of it because that was going to be my next question because it doesn't seem to me that Iran is in violation of any, any such treaty or international law provision. But thank you so much. That was Mark Sleboda speaking with us. Let me go back to Mr. Marandi here. Mr. Marandi, one of the, uh, the sort of criticisms is uh, that given the sanctions and given the state of Iran's economy, uh, Iran should perhaps be spending more on on the on the development side, on the on the you know human development index and the other social indices, rather than putting money into uh, military programs. Yes. Well, first I'd like to say that your your guest in Moscow is absolutely correct, and that's one reason why I follow him on Twitter. Uh, I think it's quite obvious that Iran, because of the sanctions is forced to uh, produce a lot of its own goods and to solve a lot of its own problems. Right now, the, because of the sanctions, the Iranians are not even uh, allowed to use most uh, satellites for their different TV channels. And that has become a major problem. Right now, you cannot ac access Iranian television in many parts of the world because the United States has simply blocked it. And this, this is just one simple example. And with regards to Iran's defense capabilities, obviously, the Iranians would like to decrease their expenditures. But when the United States has, as your previously, previous guest rightly pointed out, when it has surrounded Iran with military bases, when the U.S. president in a tweet a couple of years ago threatened to obliterate Iran, when he spoke out and said he will destroy cultural heritage sites in Iran. For what reason, I don't that was know. A, that was but, a terrible uh, statement. Actually, the statement was widely criticized by everyone, including European governments. 
when you have a, a regime like the U.S. regime that surrounds you and threatens you with, with destruction, then obviously you have to spend a part of your expenditure in preventing that from happening. But I would also like to add that, in fact, the Iranians actually do spend a great deal at home despite the sanctions. The reason why the coronavirus was contained in Iran, and Iran was hit first after China, uh, the reason why the Iranians were able to contain it, whereas the Europeans and the Americans who had much more time than the Iranians were unable to do so, was because Iran spent a lot of money in the 1980s and the 1990s in developing a primary health care network across the country, from village to town to city. The whole country is covered by this network. And because Iran has a very powerful uh, network of hospitals, public hospitals across the country, the private sector in Iran has done very little to deal with the coronavirus. So Iran, despite the sanctions, despite the fact that the Americans prevented Iran from importing test kits, they prevented Iran from importing masks and ventilators, and they basically turned the virus into a biological weapon to, to create massive damage I, in Mr. Iran. Mr. Like Morandi, I'm, I'm going I'm to return to that, but I'm also joined by George Simuli. Uh, Dr. Simuli is a senior research fellow at Global Policy Institute uh, in Budapest. Uh, Dr. Zamuli, thank you for being on the program. Uh, quickly, before I turn to the coronavirus thing and the State Department delegation and the rest of it, we're talking about the Iranian satellite launch, and it appears to us so far, uh, in terms of what we have discussed, that A, Iran was not in violation of any, any treaty or international law provision uh, for putting a satellite in space. And secondly, uh, this has been an open program in the sense that Iran has tried to do this before also. So we were just trying to figure out what exactly is the reason for this uh, sort of growing criticism of what Iran did. What's your reading of the situation? Well, of course, Iran has done nothing wrong. I Iran is perfectly entitled to launch um, military satellites into space uh, because Iran has uh, reasonable uh, grounds to fear um, uh, armed attack by uh, the United States and by Israel. Both countries have repeatedly threatened uh, Iran with military action. Um, uh, Trump tweeted out um, only uh, the other day, uh, again, yet more uh, military threats um, against uh, Iran. So it is perfectly reasonable for uh, Iran to have satellites in space in order to uh, gather intelligence about um, uh, impending uh, attacks. And as Professor Morandi uh, pointed out, uh, Iran is surrounded uh, by military bases. We're not, we're not just talking about Iraq and, um, uh, and Afghanistan on either side of Iran. Iran has a considerable uh, bases to fear um, an armed attack. And so it, it's uh, reasonable that it should take uh, preventive measures. Satellites are just simply spy, uh, spy um, uh, tools in space uh, in order to um, ascertain uh, what um, military uh, uh, installations are threatening you. Uh, but, uh, Dr. Samuli, it seems to me that, you know, I mean, and I'm specifically talking about the Trump administration. On the one hand, they're trying to pull troops out, you know, from Syria, from Afghanistan. But there's a lot of bluster also when it comes to Iran. But it seems to me that this is more a political statement rather than something that uh, they take very seriously, including the tweet that you're referring to where, uh, where uh, President Trump talked about shooting down. I don't know what he meant by shooting down naval vessels. But he talked about shooting them now, but it seems that, you know, this is one of those things that he is so fond of doing, but doesn't really follow up uh, uh, on, on the real threat. Well, you would think, but he did follow up um, on um, assassinating uh, General Soleimani. That's a, a very big deal, um, to uh, boast of uh, assassinating uh, the political political leader of a country that you are threatening. That's a, that's a serious business. Um, moreover, there are there are issues that are taking place now, such as the uh, collapsing price of oil, that may make it um, actually 
um, quite uh, quite a useful uh, time to launch a, uh, a war against Iran um, with uh, oil prices in negative territory. Um, why not have a, a war against Iran or uh, some kind of a confrontation uh, in with Iran that would lead to a nice little spike in oil prices? Um, you know, or, you know the uh, the shale industry is one of uh, Trump's biggest boasts. They've been essentially wiped out by this collapse in oil prices. This would be a nice little boost for the uh, U.S. Uh, shale oil industry. So there is every incentive for uh, Trump to launch some kind of a military confrontation with Iran. Okay, um, I am all uh, going to uh, you know wrap up this segment shortly. But I'm going to uh, read out a statement by the U.S. State Department and then quickly get a word from Mr. Maranzi and then from you, Dr. Zemuli. And it says the three governments, and this is uh, China, Iran, and Russia, the three governments are pushing a host of ma matching messages that the novel coronavirus is an American bioweapon, that the U.S. is scoring political points off the crisis, the virus didn't come from China, that U.S. troops spread it, that America's sanctions are killing Iranians, that China's response was great while the U.S. was negligent, that all three governments are managing the crisis well and that the U.S. economy can't bear the toll of the virus. Now, this is uh, somewhat uh, the crux of a U.S. State Department report. So, as I said, first, Mr. Marandi, and then Dr. Zamuli before I wrap up. I agree with everything that George said. Um, uh, and so, although I do think this is probably bluster, but Trump is Trump. We cannot be sure about it. That's why Iran has to have strong defenses to make sure that Americans recognize they cannot benefit from a, a war. But what the State Department says is actually partially true in the sense that the United States has failed in the fight against the corona. It's a catastrophe. The world is looking on in shock that the United States, which claims to be the most powerful and effective country in the world, the indispensable but, but Mr. Marandi, be... sorry, sorry for interjecting. The, the message the statement report seems to put out is that the three governments, China, Iran, and Russia, are kind of ganging up on the United States and, as they said, pushing a host of matching messages. I understood what you meant from the start. I, I, the, I th what I'm saying, though, is that the Americans have created a catastrophe. There really isn't much need for anyone to gang up. With regards to the claims that the virus came from the United States, this came from China. The Iranians never made the claim. The Iranians are just saying that the Chinese have put out this accusation. Okay. Okay. And when the Americans make such claims against other countries, they should expect the, the, the same sort of claims to be, to be fired right back at them. So the Iranians are basically telling the Americans, you can't control the narrative. Okay. Uh, quick word, Dr. Zemuli, before I wrap up. Russia and Iran have nothing to do with any of that. There's no evidence whatever that Russia or Iran are anything other than victims of the uh, virus, and they haven't put out any um, uh, misleading information. So this State Department report is just simply a more of the kind of uh, usual sp suspect. Let's bash the usual suspects uh, for um, you know disinformation and. It, it, it comes without any real evidence. And uh, thank you actually... so much. That was Sayyid Mohammed Marandi and Dr. George Muley. This is all for tonight. We shall see you tomorrow at the same time. Meanwhile, for latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.